So welcome back everyone to the Cambridge Biomedical Campus Wellness Campaign. A bit of a mouthful, so we call it CBC Wellness Campaign for short. Wherever you are in the world, welcome. We have people from Canada, the US, South Korea and all over the UK joining us today on Zoom and live streaming on YouTube. The desire and the need for wellness is universal and these webinars are not just for the 20,000 plus people working on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. They're here for everybody, so please feel free to share the links far and wide. Today, I have great pleasure in introducing Professor Pete Wilde from the Quadrum Institute in Norwich. Pete and two of his colleagues in subsequent weeks will be presenting on the subject of the science of healthy eating. And we're really grateful to the Quadrum Institute for partnering with us on this project. Pete's presentation is called, Can You Have Your Cake and Eat It? And so with no further ado, I'll hand over to him. Welcome, Pete. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Pete Wilde. I'm from the Cotterman Institute of Bioscience in Norwich. And what I want to talk to you today about is, is this subtext of can you have your cake and eat it? Uh, and it's really to get across the message about food structure and the, the form and, uh, that we eat our food in and, and the importance um, that has, an impact that has on our, on our health on our, and uh, particularly focusing on our, uh, on our appetite. So um, without further ado, if I can, there we go. So the structure of the, of the food that we eat, um, you know, uh, played a big role in our evolutionary history. So look at the, uh, the raw materials, you know, grains, um, uh, and that was, they were sort of transformed into structures that we, that we enjoy eating or, or um, uh, like bread and pasta or whatever, and fermentation, cooking, grinding, milling. Uh, to transform this, this, this structure into something which is uh, digestible, uh, it's more energy dense, uh, the energy is more available, uh, and, and also delicious, which is an important part of our, of our diet. Now, the, the form in which that food in, is in has a huge impact on the energy that, that is available. Uh, so this is some data uh, from an old paper which shows that uh, the amount of starch that is digested from potato depending on its form. So uh, if you start with raw potato, uh, very little of that starch is actually digested. Yet when you cook it, boil it, mash it, whatever, um, a huge amount of that, that starch is then becomes immediately available. In fact, mashed potato has a glycemic index of, of 100. Um, so so it, all of that energy becomes uh, immediately available. And so that those structural transformations, you know, induced by cooking and processing, um, you know, it's improved our ability to capture and utilize energy and nutrients from the food that we eat. Uh, it has improved health uh, over the millennia, uh, reduced the incidence of foodborne disease, and it underpinned our physiological development and global population expansion. There are some ideas that it helped develop the human brain size. And so it had a huge influence in, in how we developed. And so, yeah, this is data which suggests that uh, our brain size development uh, occurred uh, several million years ago, at about the same sort of time that we started cooking our food. Uh, yet some people and many believe that now that it's probably gone a little bit too far uh, and uh, our evolutionary history is, is uh, heading in a slightly different direction. Um, but the food that our ancestors ate were, was structurally very rich, you know, raw, unprocessed fruits and vegetables and meat and fish. Um, it's very slow to digest, so our, our, our bodies evolved to digest this type of food. You get a very prolonged release of energy and nutrients. There's a great seasonality to it. So we, we evolved to actually eat more energy than we actually need um, and store that as fat. Uh, because we didn't really know when our next meal was coming from and we may have had to go for long periods with no food at all. So our ability to, to take on and store that food is, was, was really, really important. 
And, and this satiating ability of food is to control how quickly we eat food and how efficiently we extract the nutrients from that food is a really important aspect. Uh, but moving to modern man, uh, uh, we, we have probably gone a little bit too far in terms of um, um, that, that release of energy. And so um, the more processed foods that, that we consume uh, are structurally very poor in, compa in comparison to the raw unprocessed foods. The energy density is, is huge. Um, those nutrients are very easy to extract and digest uh, very rapidly. Uh, our eating patterns have changed. So the food is always now uh, available. Uh, we eat several times a day, uh, often on the go, uh, quite often. And glycemic response and sugar levels are much higher. Uh, the satiety, uh, satiating aspect of those um, foods is low. And this leads to the development of, of the metabolic disorders that we all know and love. But the interesting thing is this, this change um, uh, from this type of food to the processed foods that we eat has occurred very, very recently in our evolutionary history. So effectively, we haven't evolved or adapted to a modern diet. And that is the big problem. We are still Paleolithic in terms of our digestive system and our bodies are expecting this type of food. Yet we are increasingly eating more and more of the more processed energy dense foods. And, and this has, has a, a long term impact on our health. Uh, the obesity time bomb. So this is the uh, number of obesity and of overweight individuals as a proportion of the UK population um, over age group. So as we get older, um, we get fatter, basically, and, and we're gradually putting on uh, the pounds. So as I said, we, we actually evolved to consume extra energy uh, that we actually needed at any particular time and store that as fat for, for lean times. But at the moment we don't have lean times, supermarkets are open 24 seven, um, the processing and preservation and high availability uh, of, of those foods are, are contributing to this constant uh, consumption. And this constant overconsumption leads to an increase of a, a, a long-term weight gain. And coupled with lifestyle changes, um, more sedentary lifestyles, this is increasing uh, the incidence of obesity, type two diabetes, and other uh, complications such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, et cetera. So uh, if we look, just a quick overview of the main features of digestion that we are, we are sort of interested in when we're looking at uh, how we digest and take up food. Uh, so it starts with the mouth where we have mixing and chewing to break down the structure of the, the food that we eat. There are enzymes that start breaking down the starch and there's some sensory signaling uh, which starts to sort of feed back and, and uh, inform the digestive system of the food that's about to uh, enter it. Uh, the stomach has uh, a low pH, acid pH, um, and this is where you start to, to digest uh, the food. But it also acts as a storage bag. So it, it controls the release of food uh, entering the, the small intestine um, so that the, the amount of um, nutrients is released very slowly to allow the small intestine to where the main um, site of digestion is to, to extract as much uh, energy and nutrients as, as, as possible with a range of enzymes and things like bile, which help break down the fat. And that continues throughout the length of the, uh, the small intestine uh, and finally reaching the, the colon, uh, where the, our good bacteria uh, ferment uh, things like fiber and other indigestible material to produce uh, all sorts of interesting metabolites, which can affect our, our, um, our, our health and, and uh, metabolism. Um, and one of the reasons that the small intestine is so long is that uh, there are these complex feedback signaling processes throughout the gut. And the longer that, that digestion continues, the more intense these signaling becomes to feed back to the brain and to the stomach and control our appetite 
So we're controlling uh, how much food we're taking in and how much food is being delivered, uh, being released from the stomach to allow that digestion to continue. So this, this whole feedback uh, mechanisms are really, really important in controlling um, our appetite. And what I'm going to say now really is, is about how the structure of that food uh, uh, contributes to that, that process. Um, yeah. So when I talk about structure, what am I talking about? Well, it is a whole range of, of length scales uh, from, from the molecular structure of, of uh, nutrients. Uh, this is uh, uh, glucose, two glucose molecules. Uh, how, the, how that uh, molecule is assembled into much larger structures. Uh, so this is uh, starch, a type of starch, which is lots of glucose, poly, uh, glucose molecules all uh, stuck together. Uh, and then how that is assembled into, into organelles, into structures within, uh, within cells, within, within the food. Uh, then you've got the cellular structures, how they are organized within the tissue and ultimately within the whole food structure itself. And all of these aspects influence uh, how we digest food and uh, the impact on, on appetite and nutrient release. So uh, if we take that example of, of glucose, so we've all heard of glucose. Uh, glucose is, a, is the primary energy unit that we use uh, to metabolize and, and uh, produce energy within the body. But we very rarely consume glucose as, as a, a single form. Uh, it's normally in the form of a, some sort of polymer, which is a, a linear uh, polymer of glucose molecules. And they can um, form uh, a range of, of structures. Uh, so starch uh, is a polymer of glucose. Um, and one form of starch is amylopectin, uh, which is a heavily branched um, form of starch, which is very digestible. So we can digest this uh, readily and absorb all the glucose within it. And this is why mashed potato, for example, has such a high glycemic response as so we can break down and release all of the glucose uh, from, from these, these types of structure. Um, another form of, of uh, polymer is, is glycogen, which is the animal form of, um, uh, of starch, if you like. Uh, and again, this is a, is a, a branched um, polymer of glucose subunits, uh, which again is very digestible. Uh, another form of starch is uh, amylose, and this is a sort of more linear, uh, unbranched um, polymer of, of glucose, and it forms crystalline structures, helical and crystalline structures. And this is much more slowly digested. Uh, the enzymes can't seem to access the, the bonds between the glucose molecules, and, and it's often termed as resistant starch, and it goes often to the microbiota and is fermented to produce uh, uh, beneficial metabolites. Um, another form of the polymer is beta-glucans, uh, which is a soluble fiber uh, from, from cereals. Uh, and this has been linked with a whole range of health benefits. But again, the form of the bonds between the glucose molecules uh, means renders it indigestible by our uh, enzymes, but it is fermentable uh, by our good bacteria. So, so this underpins some of the health benefits of beta-glucan. Uh, and finally, cellulose. Uh, this is a much more complex uh, structure, um, of, of, but again, all made of glucose polymers, but the structure of this renders it completely indigestible uh, to humans. And also it's very difficult to ferment by the bacteria that, that we generally have in our, in our colon. So all, although all of these are primarily uh, polymers of glucose, uh, the structure of, of the polymer that is formed uh, controls the how digestible and fermentable it is, um, and also how they respond to processing and cooking. And so, so raw starch can be uh, very poorly digestible, uh, but once it's cooked, uh, then it, it opens up the structure and it becomes much more digestible and the energy is more available. So another aspect of, of um, the food structure is, is plant tissue structure and how digestible uh, plants are. 
And the, the properties of the cell wall, which surround each plant cell, uh, are very resistant to digestion. And, and that can lead to the control of release and absorption of the nutrients that are contained within those cells. And it's a very rich source of uh, fermentable carbohydrates, which provide food to our, our good gut bacteria. Um, so, but you know, seeds and nuts, for example, have evolved to survive digestion. Uh, they're designed to be eaten by, by animals and birds and then, then be excreted and then still be viable. Um, so it was surprising to some people that, that if you look at the, the, the list of ingredients on, on say seeds and nuts, um, we don't actually absorb all of those nutrients. Um, and you know, this, this is work that came out of King's College London a few years ago. Um, and these are fecal samples. So this is uh, people, uh, human poo samples basically after they've eaten almonds. And you can still see the tissue structure is intact. All the lipids and the fats are still intact in the side of the cells. They're completely undigested and are passed out uh, at the other end in the feces. Um, so we do not um, absorb all of the nutrients contained within these, within these plant structures. So you know, can we utilize these, these structures uh, to control nutrient release to make foods healthier? So uh, some work that, that we've been involved with, uh, and this again is, is uh, almonds. Um, and all of these, and this is uh, uh, digestion, lab-based digestion experiments. And this is the amount of fat released from, um, uh, digested from, from the foods. And these are all almonds and they've all got identical composition. So if you looked at the list of ingredients, uh, they'll all be the same. But we start off with almond milk, which the structure has been completely broken down to release all the lipid. Um, and that is uh, almost completely digested. Um, if you look at individual cells and the digestion of individual cells, that is very, very resistant to digestion because those cells uh, form little um, capsules which protect those nutrients from being digested. And then if you mill the almonds to different particle sizes, um, then the bigger particles become less digestible because uh, if we see here, the, the almond milk is completely structure free. The smaller particles, uh, a lot of the uh, nutrients have been released during milling. Um, and then the large particles contain more intact cells, which, which protect those nutrients. And finally, the individual cells are all um, broken, all sort of intact and encapsulate all of the nutrients within each individual cell. And so the amount of uh, nutrients released from those cells is, is minimal. So if we can process things in a certain way, we can actually control uh, this nutrient energy release and, and availability. And, and one of my colleagues is looking at this and, and uh, Kat Edwards, she's, she's um, uh, got this uh, pulse on, uh, type of, of uh, this product, which is a legume based uh, flour, which is milled to particular sizes and the energy release uh, from the um, from the pulse on powders are much lower than than uh, finely milled flour. Um, if you're interested, uh, this is publications around this uh, here. And, and uh, so we, it shows that we can process foods in, in a relatively simple way uh, in, in order to control that, that release of nutrients. And this will like prolong appetites. It will um, reduce our uh, subsequent consumption of, of food. And um, interestingly, if you look at the ingredients in say an almond, for example, um, it's about 50% uh, fat. Um, a little bit of saturated fat, but it's about 50% fat. So people would associate this with a, a high energy, high fat food. Uh, it's probably unhealthy, but actually it's associated with, with reduced hunger, uh, reduced lower uh, energy intake at subsequent meals. So um, this, this, this shows the, um, the hunger ratings of individuals going, being fed different uh, um, uh, meals and one containing the almond and the hunger uh, ratings are much lower uh, than, um, than in the control uh, meals. Uh, 
So, so despite that high fat content, uh, it is actually linked, consumption of almonds are linked with, with appetite suppression and reduced energy intake. And it's precisely because of this controlled release of energy and reduced energy uh, absorption uh, that is responsible uh, for this effect. Um, so another aspect of, of this, and, and we've already touched on this with comparing the almond milk with, with milled almonds, is uh, consumption of fruits versus fruit juice. Um, and I've, I've got a video later on which, which, which shows this quite, quite nicely. So this is uh, some work coming out of these prospective cohort studies uh, where, where medical um, health workers were followed uh, for uh, 20 or more years. Um, there's about 200,000 uh, people involved in this. And uh, what they found in one of the analyses of the, the data that came out of this, um, that if you compared individuals who regularly ate whole fruits versus people who regularly consume the same fruit, but in the form of a juice, there was a big difference in their, uh, in their health outcomes. And the greater consumption of whole fruits um, led to a lower risk of type, developing type two diabetes. Whereas a greater consumption of fruit juice is associated with a higher risk of developing type two diabetes. And so this, this rate of, of nutrient availability uh, you know, has, has a, a, a long-term effect on, on health with constant uh, consumption of fruits, uh, fruit juice versus, versus whole fruits. And this is driven, I suppose, by, by this, uh, the five a day message where, where people are encouraged to eat uh, five colored fruit and vegetables. And so consuming that in the form of a juice was, was felt to be healthier. So it may protect against some uh, health effects, but actually contributes negatively uh, to others. And there are, there are several reasons behind this, and we'll, we'll go into some of those uh, now. So, so one, one aspect of, of this is that you eat something which has been processed, which, uh, which is unstructured much faster than, than a whole food. So eating faster can actually lead to um, excess energy intake and, and weight gain. And, and so some individual, this, this study, uh, they showed that um, consuming a, a, an energy matched, uh, energy density matched diets, um, either ultra processed or unprocessed, um, people consumed much more uh, of the ultra processed uh, foods and consequently they, they um, put on more weight and they effectively ate about 500 calories a day more. They were just allowed to eat whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, uh, but they were just limited to these uh, uh, two diets. Uh, and as you can say, and, and also uh, in general, um, processed foods are much more energy dense. So these, these both these, these um, range of foods have um, 1500 calories. Um, you can see that with the unprocessed, um, the, the density is spread over a much greater amount of food so the energy density is, is much lower so consuming this will take a lot more effort than, than consuming that so you know highly processed foods you know are consumed more quickly and this can lead to to greater energy intake so this is this is a video which sort of demonstrates this really nicely this is this is uh Kees de Graaf he's a researcher in Wageningen and Houston University in the Netherlands and um, he had a PhD student, and the, one of the first things he got this student to, uh, uh, to do was to do this experiment. And, and uh, so I'll, I'll run the video. And uh, um, it's a, I've met this guy, actually. It's, it's, it's a really interesting story. But basically, it's, again, it's about fruit off fruit juice. So, so Guido Camps was a PhD student, and he didn't really know what he was letting himself in for. And he was asked to consume uh, a kilo of grapes in two forms. So one in the form of a juice, so that's been just uh, juiced into a liter of uh, grape juice, and the other uh, in the form of a kilo of, of uh, whole grapes. And these are run on uh, different days. And so you can see he's, he's consuming the, the juice fairly quickly, and uh, it goes down uh, within a less than a minute, I believe. Um, and he then continues to um, 
you know, one and a half minutes, is consumed the, the entire uh, kilo of grapes as the juice, and then he carries on and he's, he has to eat them all. And this goes on for a little while. And uh, you, can, you can see the full video um, or the full lecture uh, on, on YouTube, and the link is, is here. Um, so sort of chatting forward in time, you can see he's really starting to struggle now, eating all of these grapes. And he was quite happy eating, uh, drinking the, the juice, but he's really starting to struggle. And basically he's taking a lot longer to consume the same amount of energy. Um, and, and also the other question that, um, that we're starting to ask as well is, is low calorie always the best option? Um, so reducing the energy content of foods by using taste and texture modifiers, they can replace sugar and fat, but retain that, that sensory property, so retain the structure and, and the flavor and the, and the taste. Um, but as I said, the, the um, appetite control mechanisms uh, that we have in our bodies are you know, very complex feedback mechanisms. And if we consume a food, um, there's all sorts of sensory cues, the sweetness, the fat content, the thickness, the texture, and that sensory perception um, gives you an expected satiety or an expected nutrient status. So you're, if you taste something that's very sweet, you expect it to deliver lots of sugar to the body. Uh, and, it, and it feels maybe like it will fill you up uh, more quickly. You know, when you eat something, it's very, very sweet. It feels sort of almost sickly because you, did, and you can't eat that much of it. Um, but when you've actually consumed that food, uh, your body senses the actual nutrient content and the actual nutrient absorption. And then you result in an actual nutrient status of energy uh, consumed or absorbed. And then there's then a mismatch between what you're expecting to happen and what actually happened. And this then leads to a control of appetite. And, and um, th this is work done uh, a few years ago in, in Brighton, in, in Sussex. And um, basically the upshot is uh, if there's a big mismatch between um, the sensory and actual energy content, so a low energy, um, but a high sensory food. Um, this is what happens when at subsequent meals, the, um, the individual would consume more food uh, than if it, the, um, the food, original food actually contained sugar and fat. Uh, so you actually overcompensate for that loss of calories that you've consumed. Uh, so it's you've got to be very careful about uh, using sort of fat free or sugar free foods uh, and expecting uh, to lose weight because your body then will be craving more energy to make up for the energy that it didn't, didn't actually get. Um, another aspect is, is what happens in, in your stomach. Um, there some interesting uh, studies have looked at um, how, how milk proteins can affect uh, appetite. And, and what happens when you consume uh, uh, milk proteins, um, you get uh, face separation, and these proteins start to aggregate in the, in the stomach when the pH, when they hit that low pH, the acid pH, and you're, you're effectively making cheese. So, so uh, these proteins, um, are broken down by, by enzymes and the acid pH forces them to form these gels and they sit in the stomach and just very slowly release uh, the energy and the protein. And this, this is what happens for infants um, on, on, um, on milk, eating, uh, uh, consuming milk, um, that this controls the, the uh, release of, of um, energy and protein so that their digestive system can cope with the uh, uh, the amount of material that is being being delivered, and and you can control this again by by uh, processing. So this is a UHT milk, and the structures uh, formed are much weaker uh, and more dispersed. So that will lead to a much quicker release of uh, of energy and, and protein, which is uh, uh, you know could be useful for um, uh, athletes recovering from exercise or for the elderly. Uh, suffering from lean muscle mass loss, sarcopenia. 
and and so and we found that it's the casein fraction of the uh, of the of the milk proteins that form this this gel, and the whey proteins uh, remain in a in a liquid phase. And so basically, you're making curds and whey. You're you're effectively making cheese in your stomach, and that leads to faster. Uh, the whey is delivered more quickly, and the caseins are delivered and digested much more slowly. So um, to bring this all together, it's a bit of a, been a bit of a whirlwind tour of, of, of food structure, but um, I've hoped um, I've got a, the message across to you that um, of the importance of the structure of the food that we eat and how that can impact on our health. So foods containing intact structures or structures which are resistant to digestion, um, they may be more slowly consumed. Um, they are often uh, digested much more slowly, so you get this sustained release of energy. This controls your appetite, promotes satiation and satiety. Uh, it's often linked with, with high fibre foods, so you, you're delivering food and nutrition to your microbiota to keep them healthy and diverse. So really the, the message is to you know, consider structure of your food as well as the composition of your food. Remember the fruits versus fruit juice, it's not that simple uh, as composition, but also it leads to uh, a whole range of effects in terms of consumption rate and energy rate, rate release. So you could have your cake, but you probably won't want to eat it. So I do apologize for that. Um, 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 thank you for all your attention. I'm more than happy to take uh, questions. Pete, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating, mm -hmm. I have to say. Um, we've got some questions coming in, I think, on the chat. So you can put your questions on the Q&A or you can put them in the chat, what, whichever one you prefer. Uh, let's have a look and see what questions we've got. We've got somebody here saying that they've had their colon completely removed because of inflammatory bowel disease. How can people like me improve our small intestine bacteria? Um, that's a little bit out of my comfort zone, I'm afraid. Um, but yes, I mean, you, you do have microbiota um, throughout your GI tract. They're just much more concentrated in the colon. Um, um, but certainly at the, the far end of the, the small intestine, there's, there's significant amounts of bacteria uh, and, and they feed on the same sort of thing. So, you know, um, you know high fiber, uh, soluble fibers are, are, are good food for those bacteria. But I, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in that particular condition. And I, I, I know of relatives who uh, with certain good problems, they have to avoid fiber um, because it can cause all sorts of other uh, problems. Um, so it's best to probably seek medical advice as to the best form of, of nutritional intervention to maintain a healthy microbiota. Absolutely. Thanks, Pete. Um, also got something, uh, a message coming in here. Is it also true of fruits, veg smoothies? And I'm assuming what they mean is because it's the whole fruit or whole veg that has been smooth. Is that better for us than pure juice? Um, I, I would say yes, generally, um, because you've got the fibre content there. So, so you're, you're one, of the, one of the, well, I think the really stupid things about, about juices is you're removing all the fibre. You're just, you're just taking the juice. So you're removing all the goodness. Um, so, so having the fibre there in, in smoothie is, is, has got benefits. But you've still got to bear in mind that you're consuming, you know, a lot of that energy is still highly available, those sugars, that fructose uh, is highly available and it's consumed very quickly. So look at the amount of that smoothie that you're, you're consuming. Uh, but yes, certainly the fiber uh, content is much better. Excellent, good to hear. And we've got a question come in, what effect if any does chewing food less before swallowing have on the digestion process and energy release? That's a really good question and, and um, some work coming out of uh, Keith de Graaf's group in Park and England have done looking at this and you know consuming your food more quickly so um, there's a whole area of science around chewing and you get people with different types of chewing mechanisms you get smoochers you get grinders 
all sorts of different yeah it's it's it's, it's, it's a whole area of science in itself and, and people who consume uh, food more quickly they chew it less and swallow it quickly take on more energy more quickly and so they do tend to well, they can be prone to be put, putting on more weight more quickly um, also when you're consuming food more slowly you're taking more saliva in which adds volume to the stomach which makes you feel fuller uh, more quickly and the energy density is, is slightly less um, there is a caveat to that that when you're when you chew your food more you break down the particles much more so some of, more of that energy might be available so there is that that balance between between the two okay thank you pete um we've got another question here can yogurt provide the same benefit as milk um what yeah well it depends on what benefit i mean it's, it's, it's a tricky one i mean yes um uh, yogurt is tends to be higher in protein it's rich in calcium and lots of lots of uh, micronutrients um there is some evidence that i think the fermentation of the yogurt releases other bioactive peptides and compounds which can uh, have have certain um beneficial effects but again i'm not i'm not really a um an expert uh from this structure perspective um you probably eat less volume because of the yogurt is, is thicker more viscous so it fills your stomach up much more easily and it's more slowly emptied um so so yes i think you know there's there's um, the, there are definitely sort of benefits of, of eating uh, yogurt um, from a structural perspective because you consume less of it rather than you may well quite easily drink a pint of milk you probably only um, eat maybe 150 mils of, of, of yogurt yes absolutely uh the questions are pouring in now is absorption affected by someone's individual microbiome um e potentially yes like the previous question if you're looking at the microbiota of your upper gi tract where some absorption takes place uh, it, there, there can be an influence there um but the majority of the absorption um, uh, takes place uh, in, the, in, the, in the first part of the small intestine. And that's all down to the, um, the enzyme composition that are secreted from the pancreas and the stomach. Um, and so that's, that's, that influences the actual absorption more. But there are certainly, as I said, about this feedback mechanism throughout the gut and the microbiota do influence that feedback mechanism a lot and can control uh, the gastric emptying. So how much of the food is, is emptied from the stomach at a particular time can be influenced by, by the microbiota. Mm, this is absolutely fascinating. So let's just have a look at some more questions that we've got coming in. Um, I make a lot of vegetable soups. That's not me. That's uh, somebody in the audience. I make a lot of vegetable soups. Does the pureeing of them reduce their beneficial impact? um uh, yeah it's uh, this is this isn't simple either um <laughs> <laughs> because yeah there's there's something um people have shown in these experiments um so uh, pure um yeah whizzing up and pureeing um vegetables um has two effects one the energy is more available so so we say the starch um, it's more it's more available but things like the um, um, fat soluble vitamins same carrots vitamin a precursors beta carotenes uh, are much more available uh, if you eat a raw carrot you absorb very little of those beneficial compounds but you you cook it you mash it up puree it those compounds become much more available so actually the there are flip size to either so people ask me is it best to cook or eat raw well a bit of both so if you eat things raw you get the structure um, you get the, those those effects which we've talked about on appetites you get the water soluble vitamins um, which are sometimes destroyed with cooking but with a cooked vegetable you get those fat soluble vitamins and those other micronutrients released and much more available 
Uh, and another thing with soups, which is really interesting, is that if you get the, the viscosity right of those soups, you have a like, nice thick pureed soup, that can actually stay in the stomach for a lot longer and make you feel fuller for longer compared to a thin soup or that same meal uh, consumed in as, uh, separately as a solid and liquid food. So combining That's... that can actually control the release of nutrients from, from the stomach. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, another question here, would you recommend eating muesli granola for breakfast? Um, it would, yeah, muesli is always a good thing. I'm a great fan of oats, uh, muesli and porridge. There's some interesting, uh, we did a bit of work on, on this about the release of beta-glucans and the viscosity. Um, some people associate greater satiety feelings from muesli than compared to porridge. Uh, which, are, which is quite interesting. Um, but also the porridge, the, the starch is gelatinized and it's become more, more available and more energy dense. Um, the granola, I'm, I'm not an expert on granola. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, muesli is good anyway. We, we muesli like muesli. is good. Muesli. I mean, raw, yeah, raw, um, oat, you know, the, the milled oats, the, the rolled oats are great because you get a very slow release of energy, slow release of the beta glucans. Uh, it's, um, it's great stuff. Excellent. Now, we do still have quite a few questions coming in. We were due to finish at quarter past, but we can slightly overrun on this. Those of you who need to hop off, do remember that there is a recording of this that, that will be sent out to you, so you'll be able to catch up on what you've missed. Um, the ability of milk proteins to aggregate in the stomach affects digestive rate and appetite response. Does the same apply to other proteins, or is this milk in particular? Um, it's, it's definitely milk in particular, but we, we've seen the similar effects in soy milk as well. Uh, a lot of proteins aggregate at sort of mildly acidic uh, conditions. I mean, milk has been, you know, uh, you know maternal milk, whether it's human or cow, whatever, has, has been designed to, to do this um, for the infant to, to gel in the stomach and slowly release that that nutrient the protein and the energy um but but some of the proteins do so i mean you, you can make tofu you know you know you make tofu um from soy milk uh, and that does a similar thing in, in in the stomach but not to as great an extent and and the processing is really important the the biggest effect is in raw milk as soon as you start to heat treat it homogenize it then that that effect uh, decreases but something like going back to yogurt, that has partially gone through that process already. So that then is more prone to to form these these structures in the stomach because it's been pre almost pre digested a little bit, if you like. Does digestion affect your sleep? And what are the best bedtime snacks to eat, if any? Uh, no idea. Sorry, I'm not even going to pretend to know the answer to that one. Um, no problem at all. Let's skip on to the next one then. It's obviously a very complex feedback system reappetite. What are the main influences? Is the stomach more important than the intestine, usually, for example? It's yeah, that's a really good question. Again, I think I mean they all play a role because the the, the, the emphasis is to control the rate of nutrient release and, and maximize the amount of nutrients that we, we absorb. Um, and they're all linked together. So, so um, when you start digesting something in the stomach, you, it, some of it is released. Um, sensors in the small intestine sense the nutrient content or the energy content of that meal. And then, so if it's a high energy content, then it signals to the stomach to slow down stop and, and control emptying. Um, and then those, those, sensing mechanisms get more intense the further down the small intestine you go uh, and even in the in the colon as well there are still uh, signaling mechanisms there to control uh, gut motility and the, the the speed at which your food passes through through the gut so so they all play a role um, and some may be more important in different types of foods compared to others so the stomach may be more important for things like milk and yogurt like i said um, and uh, the, the small intestine may be, may be more important for 
other other foods where you're getting a slow release of energy and you get those more intense signaling mechanisms uh, later on. Uh, another question here. I work with adults who have learning disabilities and some will refuse fruit and vegetables. How do we encourage them to eat healthily if they refuse fruit and vegetables? Yeah, that's that's interesting. That, that's one of the things that we're trying to do with the research that we're doing is trying to. And, and that example of this pulse on these these legume flowers um, are, are a great example of how we can process foods in a way that you know, people you know, um, maybe don't want to consume lots of chickpeas and lentils, but if that can be milled into an ingredient which is incorporated into bread, for example. Um, in, in terms of getting people to eat food, I mean, it's the same thing, you know, um, incorporating, you know, it's about processing those foods into, into a form that can be incorporated as an ingredient into the food that can be consumed um yeah yes yes it's it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one i mean yeah, this is where juice is juices and smoothies are, are can play a key role but mm. the amount has got to be controlled so you avoid that uh, big uh, dose of sugar but you're delivering sufficient beneficial micronutrients and antioxidants and, and vitamins um in, in an appropriate amount and, and not uh, overloading. Now, here's another question. If I wish to gain weight without taxing the pancreas, what should my priorities be? Ooh, mm. that's an interesting question. I, I, again, I, I, we can I skip. It's looking, it's look, yeah, I mean, it's, look, it's looking at the energy density of something and, and you know, um, yeah, that's fine. Heart let's let, let's oh, move yeah. on to the, to yeah. the next question. Um, this is one that might be popular. Is there any cake that we can eat in small amounts, such as banana muffins, carrot cake? Yeah, I mean, any any cake you can eat in small amounts. It's um, a, a great nutritionist uh, at the institute who retired many years ago. Uh, he gave a leaving lecture. And uh, his his modicum was was everything in moderation. You can enjoy a cake is there to be enjoyed in small amounts. That's exactly what it should be done. And chocolate, um, but if you want to make it slightly less um, or slightly more guilt free, then yes, incorporating some uh, some some fruits or nuts uh, in there mm. would um, so it gives you that increasing the fiber content and the micronutrient content. Yes, yeah, damps down the. Uh, but, you know, don't feel guilty about it. If you have a, want to have a cake every now and again, there's nothing wrong with that. Excellent. Uh, how do hormones influence our feelings of being full? I always become voraciously hungry when having to take cortis, corticosteroids, which are a sort of hormone. Thanks so much for this talk. It's fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, it, they are hormones which control our appetite. These small peptides are, are hormones and they act on receptors in the brain. Um, so, so there are a whole range of compounds which can affect that appetite and those hormones can trigger um, feelings of hunger or, or reduction in appetite. Uh, I couldn't tell you which ones are which, but, but certainly you know, they will be acting on, on similar receptors in the brain that our hunger hormones act on. And we've got what looks like a final question here, unless more come in. I've had my gallbladder removed and was told to eat low fat, but clearly that creates that gap due to the sensory properties causing increased appetite. Any suggestions to help with this, please? Hmm. Yeah, um, that's, it. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, what I would do is not eat um, things labelled as low fat, but just eat less fat. Um, so in foods which are um, which taste like like they have got fat in, but at lower amounts, um, rather than having a food which you would normally associate with containing a lot of fat, it tastes like it's got a lot of fat in, but is low fat. Then that's when you're when you're trying to fool your sensory. Uh, and physiological mechanisms. So 
just eat, trying to eat foods which con uh, naturally contain less fat. Thank you, Pete. Uh, that looks like it's the end of our questions. We've got people coming in on the chat saying very interesting talk. Thank you. Lots of thanks. So I want to thank you as well, Pete, for an amazing presentation today. And also want to thank everybody for joining us. Those of you who've joined us live and those of you tuning in for the recording. In two weeks time on Tuesday, the 1st of March 2022, we've got the second webinar in this series, The Science of Healthy Eating, when we'll welcome Molly Miller from the Quadrum Institute again, who will talk to us about fibre, what is it good for? A moving experience, you might think. And on the 15th of March, we welcome Barbara Nemakova, who will look at recipes with us and even a cookery demonstration, and that's entitled Ready, Steady, Cook. So for more details on any of these and to book, simply search Eventbrite CBCWC and it should come up on your search engine. If you miss any of these webinars, simply go to the Cambridge Biomedical Campus YouTube channel to catch up. And if any of you have any ideas for future wellness campaign webinars, do get in touch with me via Eventbrite. It's lovely to have seen you all today and we very much look forward to seeing you at the next CBC Wellness Campaign event. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.